who's this person on my security camera trying to get into the studio to get a camera right now? Steven, what are you doing? Why are you unannounced on a weekend? Unbelievable. He's trying to steal cameras. I think he's trying to steal cameras. He's not really trying to steal cameras. Steven, why are you coming to the factory on weekends when no one's here sneaking <laughs> your way in trying to Trust steal me, some R5s? I did not want to come on a weekend, but I had to because I totally forgot that I was supposed to photograph my niece's uh, first communion on Sunday morning. And I'm like, oh, crap, I have no gear on me. I have no lenses. Where's your nothing. 5D Mark IV? It's still here, but I've only I sold all my lenses except my 24 to 72 8. So at this point, I've got like nothing left. Didn't someone recently ask to buy your camera? What happened with that? With with the phone number of 313-710-9729, text in that they wanted to buy your camera? Yes. I actually had three people reach out to me, but one of them uh, followed up. The other two did not. So I will, be, I will be selling Losers. my camera, my 5D Mark IV. Finally. It only took two years to, to actually sell it. Uh, hopefully you know this I week just, I'll get it boxed up for them. You know what I just realized, Stephen? My voice is like... 90% back. I went a whole week without having the ability to really talk, which sucks. Yeah, your voice was really shot. And thankfully, it was after we had to film most of that stuff last week. Yeah, I had some kind of throat thing. Coldies, man. The coldies, I took them. <laughs> it definitely helped. It only cut it down to seven days. <laughs> every time I'm sick, Jared's like, just take a coldies. It works every time. Cures you up. You can yeah, be on your well, deathbed. Coldies. <laughs> coldies. It, it's the answer. Uh, it's a repository. Yeah. Stick it up your ass oh, next we'll time. It will work better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it works its way backwards. Oh, God. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I had, I didn't feel terrible, which was good, but I had a throaty thing and the throat thing was, was not allowing me to talk very well. And you can hear it in uh, photo news, uh, yeah, photo news fix this week. I had a little trouble because I couldn't yell. Anytime I got loud, my voice would crack. just disappear or crack <laughs> and be totally gone. So anyway, why were you stealing gear this weekend from the studio? Yeah, so I had to photograph my niece's first communion. Uh, just a couple pictures back at the house. Uh, I usually do the church as well, except this time I'm glad I did not even bring my gear there because it was total chaos at the church. I mean, completely packed. They were all the way at the front. I was all the way at the back. There would have been no, I would have just got the back of their heads. You know, there's really Why didn't no you point. go up to the front? Why don't you say, do you know who I am? I'm Steven Eckert. Well, first of all, I had my uh, infant with me, my seven month old. So it wasn't really possible to run to the front. But yeah, usually I bring my camera gear to the church. It was way too packed to even attempt to take any photos in there. So we went back to the house. The issue there is that, you know, my niece is eight years old and she's silly and doesn't really like to uh, take pictures and stuff like that. So it was pulling teeth trying to get any pictures of her. <laughs> look this way, look that way. And she would just look the complete opposite way to be like silly. So I have yet to even look at these photos a few days later because I'm just nervous to see what I even got because I don't think I got anything. On top of that, we had to do it in the sunroom in the front of the house, which is right next to the front door. So kids are coming in and out, distracting her like crazy. At the end of the day, all I have to say is kids are very hard to photograph, especially when they're that like six to seven, eight year old range. No, that's the easy range, yeah, usually. It depends what kind of kid you have. I mean, Lil Dan at two and a half years old running around when we were trying to get that portrait of him for the uh, the holiday video that we did. Oh, yeah. That was good. Dan, he was such a good little kid just <laughs> sitting there doing nothing, eating donuts and drinking juice. He didn't run around the studio for 20 minutes. Kids in general, uh, let me fix that age range from zero years old all the way up to like nine. Uh, either they're running around like crazy or they just won't listen at all. Or they can't sit up like Hannah at Disney World and we have to do some crazy photoshopping. Yeah. What was that video called? The Holiday Portrait? Uh, I don't remember. Lil Dan doesn't sit. I mean, it, they were good pictures because I'm a good photographer. Oh, you mean the one that I set up all the lighting for you and you just had to snap pictures? <laughs> I'm like Annie Leibovitz. <laughs> hey, set this up for me and then I'm going to come in and press the button. <laughs> yeah, that one was holiday portrait flash photography tutorial with cheap gear. And it only has, I mean, it has 87,000 views, but I'm surprised over the years it hasn't gotten more with a title like that, like how to take a holiday portrait or something like that. Anyway, we've got um, uh, a, a lot to talk about this week. Uh, everything from um, Frontos Photo Photo Day at the uh, the Phillies game. Speaking We're going to be doing that. Band. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you about that in a second. I forgot a memory card when I went out on a shoot, you know, because I'm all about wow. film now. Amateur Who needs memory hour. cards. We're going to talk about this uh, uh, MKBHD thing going around where he talked 
uh, didn't like a product and and Petapixel wrote an article about it where they since changed the title, but the title is still there in the slug of the URL. And I left a comment on it when they do dumb shit. I'm going to leave a dumb, I'm not a dumb comment. I'm just going to comment on it. Uh, and then last week I left it that I was going to go pick up my negatives, the first negatives from the Phillies games and talk about if they worked. And, and if you've been following my Instagram, <laughs> yeah, if you follow, if you've been following my Instagram, you you will have a better understanding of what's been going on. But if you don't, then I'll talk about it here in more detail because there's a lot that has happened in the last week of uh, well, the Phillies were home nine out of ten days, which is kind of insane. So they've played like uh, six games in the last six days. They're off today, and then they have three more this weekend. Well, then they're away for like ten or so days. Yeah, then they're going to go to London. In June, I'm not going to go to London, I don't think. I say that now. Where they play at? I have no idea where they play. Hmm. There's a stadium there. I didn't know if it was something unique or if they were playing somewhere with an awesome backdrop that you can get no. some really interesting photos at. No, you can't. It's not. If it's just a regular stadium, then yeah, whatever. It's a regular stadium. My buddy shot it last year because he's with the Cubs. And the the problem is when people travel, they just take the, the news people take the same picture as they would take if it was in Philly. A tight picture of a player who hit a home run rounding the bag. It's like... It's coverage. That's all it is. Yeah, and where's the story? Where's the ambiance? Where is the defining uh, scenery in the shot to show you that it was taken somewhere other than Philly? Like, that's the stuff you need to think about. I mean, I definitely fell in that trap on certain occasions with uh, concert photography. It just becomes monotonous and you're just there for three songs. You're just getting coverage in general. You don't have a ton of access. You only have, uh, you know, the the front pit and that's it. So it got to the point where sometimes I was like, whatever, I'm just taking a couple photos and I'm out like a band I don't care about. I don't want to be here. Whatever. I'm sure that happens with a lot of sports photographers, too. Uh, Yeah, that can that can happen where people just get lazy and they just take waste pictures and that's not exciting yeah especially when there's nothing exciting going on like it's just another mid-season game yeah that's why it gets boring to shoot anyway i decided the other night i'm like steven should we do a fronos photo day at the phillies game when they have a one third a 105 start on a wednesday and i was like oh during the work day sure and then I'm like, should we invite Dan and little Dan? And you're like, no, no, I didn't no. say that. I really didn't say that, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I invited Dan and little Dan and we got seats in section 104 row three, which is right in the outfield. I won't be able to see anything because it's too far away for me. And I know that already, but it will be bring your 600 millimeter lens. I can. I can bring anything in. I have my pass. I can you do whatever I want. Mess up anyone's view at all. No, oh, no, not unless. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't need to do that. I'm um, but uh, you know, it's a day that we will go out there, and and you guys can sit there and en- enjoy the game. And little Dan, I don't know if he's ever been to a baseball game or not. He'll get to sit there. He could eat federal donuts because there are federal donuts there. Yeah, I don't know if he's actually been to a, a Phillies game or not. Uh, Might probably be his first. not. He's probably a vegan. The The Phillies may... Oh, shit. I wonder if he can eat donuts. May 8th. Uh, it's on May 8th at 105. It's a 105 start. It's a business person special. Ooh. And it's where you don't go to work that day and, yes. you, and you go shoot a game. The problem is the game's at 105. The game will probably be over by 323. Or what's going to happen is we're going to go and the whole time we're just going to talk about business and work. <laughs> I always talk about business exactly. and work. Exactly. That's what I do. That's why it was never fun to go out to lunch with you because I would just work all morning and then I'd have to go to lunch and finally get a little bit of a break and all we talk about is work. That's my freedom. That's my free time. Yep. To talk about whatever I want to talk about. And that's work. my free time where I don't want to talk about work. Hey, who's buying you lunch, Stephen? Next time you buy lunch, you could talk about what you want. Hey, I usually offer unless it's like a business lunch. Yeah, no, you 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 did offer. There were very few other uh, people might other not have. people <laughs> named... Uh, uh say well, it. uh <laughs> uh dot uh dot uh lafwa <laughs> what dot wafa it's backwards steven oh oh dot wafla e e full oh, dot e <laughs> just <laughs> reverse it <laughs> Anyway, so we're going to be doing that. Um, And then for one of the Phillies games, I actually had to use something that wasn't a uh, film camera, you know, shooting four by five, because we're still we tested out that Lawa 10 millimeter lens. And I'm like, 
well, this is what it would be perfect for 10 millimeters upstairs. Uh, I thought, I, mean, I, I guess I could have compared it to a Canon because I have the 10, but that is just too, too much work. That's just too well, much work. Uh, I mean, it's also kind of pointless just because you're not buying that Canon regardless, but I guess quality well, wise. Are you though? Because they make it for Canon RF and manual. Yeah, but it's a manual focused lens. So, but it, I hope it's not seven. No, it was cheap, right? It was like four hundred dollars manual focus because the can the only ten millimeter you can get for Canon is the ten to twenty, which is like really expensive. So, but I went up into actually, f- I think it's the same price, but no, they have a cookie lens, an f four ten millimeter for three hundred dollars. But no, the normal ten millimeter two point eight is eight hundred dollars, even manual focus for Canon RF. What's a cookie lens? It's a like a pancake lens. I guess they call it cookie, but it's basically a that pancake is lens. stupid, Stephen. But it, it's either a five blade or a fourteen blade aperture, depending on how you want your bokeh, your favorite thing to talk about. And yeah, yeah if it's manual focus for Canon RF, it's the same price as the Nikon autofocus version. The moral of the story is it looked very good. The pictures look really good from up there. Hey, man, I thought that lens was pretty cool. Uh, that review should be probably coming out this weekend, if I had to guess. The the, the thing I was bringing this up for is I uh, forgot to put a. A, a, a card inside the Z9. The Z9 was upstairs on the desk for filming. Then I brought it downstairs. I knew I had to put a card in, but I forgot to put the card in. So I get to take the pictures after I finish with the four by five and I open up the thing and I'm like, fuck, I got no, I got no card. So I went and talked to one of the other photographers who has Canon R3s and I'm like, um, can I, can I, do you have an extra CF Express B card? And he did in an R5 that he wasn't using. I'm like, can I take pictures with it? And then you can upload them later for me and I'll send you a link. And he did. So, I mean, this is kind of why I understand why these manufacturers are still putting in SD card slots as a second uh, card slot, just because when you're in a pinch like that, it's a lot easier to find an SD card than a CF Express type B. Yeah. But I had no card, but I got the job done. So that is good. Um, you want to talk about, let's talk about the MKBHD stuff. So we give people a rest from four by five and film and baseball. Yes. So MKBHD puts out a review and it is, let's see, Stephen, what's the title that MKBHD put on that video? It's called the worst product I've ever reviewed dot, dot, dot for now. And it's, uh, what for the humane AI pin? It's like an AI assistant, like a more advanced Siri that you place on yourself. Yeah, the dumbest, one of the dumbest things ever. Do you know they've raised over two hundred million dollars plus to build this piece of shit? It's probably because of the buzzword of like AI in the product name. Well, so I, I from reading up on it or whoever talked about it, is that originally they had a different concept. But when AI became hot, they changed it to to focus on that. Mm. And so it's like this pin that you wear on your your shirt. So you look like a douche. And then you hold your palm up and it has like this laser projector that projects stuff on your hand. But the problem with the thing is that it's a $24.99 a month um, a monthly service fee for access to the cell network because it doesn't pair with your phone. So you can't piggyback off of your phone network. You're supposed to wear this thing and ask it stupid questions, <laughs> which is stupid. The reason they got so much money is it was started by two ex uh, Apple engineers. It's just a stupid idea. And I think his big gripe was that it basically took longer to ask the AI assistant a question than to just Google whatever your question was on a phone. Yeah. So the reason we're bring, I'm bringing this up is I went on Petapixel because I checked them. They're, they're good for news. And then I can just, you know, have the news after they do the news. <laughs> and uh, I can just copy it, was, it and paste well, it. No, so <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day because you know, someone would say, like, you're just copying Petapixel. Well, we're not copying Petapixel when it comes to any new camera gear stuff because all of that we're privy to at the same time. We're usually briefed on, uh, yes. As them, so we're already briefed. I don't go to the, I don't go to them for the basic stuff. I go to them for some extra things that I might not ever go look for. And so while I'm there, I just read the the titles and the articles and then sometimes they just write dumb shit, which which they which they did this time. And this time the the they they put the article up where it talked about MKBHD doing this, and they since have changed the title. Now, the original title was Marquez Brownlee criticized for unethical review of humane AI pin. That was the original title. Hmm. And so you start reading the article and you're like, 
wait a second, a couple of Twitter people said that he was being unethical, and this is the title you guys put on it? Titles are very important for multiple reasons. One, you want to get people to click. Two, you want to have a conversation about the title. But three, if you have a title that skews one way or the other and is misleading, then people are going to piggyback off of that and start commenting super negatively. So if you have a super negative headline, it leads to shit going wrong. And it's people just reading the title and not even reading the article, reading the article. Yeah. So I went back on because I commented. I'm like, what are you guys talking about from a site that makes reviews? How are you going to call his his review unethical? And they were basically like, well, we didn't call it unethical. The Twitter people did. So they changed the title to MKBHD calls humane AI pin the worst product he's ever reviewed. Did you get them to change the title? I didn't. No, I'm sure because there were other comments other people commenting on okay. it. Yeah, it's just like, you know, like I, I don't feel like I need to comment on everything, though. I, I wanted to know. comment. <laughs> look, I wanted to comment this morning on their thing, and I actually did. But then I deleted it. Um, you know how Potato Jet, I don't know if you saw, teamed up with Small Rig to make this one squeeze button tripod video tripod looks thing? Looks pretty badass. Right. Looks really cool. So What's they the wrote price the of that, by the way, real quick? I don't know if there's a price. I got to talk okay. to them about it. I'll send them a message. I would love something like that. Yeah, I'm going to send them a message. My problem was when you're reading the article, it talks about the height, right? in centimeters okay and they didn't go ahead and put in their inches like what do you think you are like uh sophisticated because you know centimeters like how do you not convert it and yeah we are here in this country where we don't use the imperial or met whatever the met the metric system we use some dumbass thing that we never changed from because we're idiots and want to be different but like you right there, it's 268 centimeters. The, why don't you write how many inches that is for the American followers that are reading it? Do you think you're like special? You went to some Ivy League school that you didn't go to that you think that you're smarter than everybody else? Like that's what it comes down to. So it's just like when we do videos now, and we didn't do this before where we talk about the weight of something, we used to do it in just pounds. Uh, now we add grams. Yeah, grams, kilograms. We try to uh, help our metric system friends out uh, across the pond. But unfortunately, so they don't have to do this. So they don't have to go to their humane pin and say, humane pin, <laughs> how many inches is 263 centimeters? That would be eight miles. Unfortunately, you know, America think, still deals with the imperial system, which makes zero sense because it's so much easier with the metric system. Everything is in factors of 10, but not the U.S., no, not us. But anyway, so, so let's talk about this. You know, is MKBHD being unethical by calling a product the worst product he's ever reviewed? And the answer is simple, Stephen. No, it's called being a good reviewer. He reviews products. People look to him to make their buying decisions. Or even if they're not buying something, they still watch the review because they're curious to hear what he has to say. If you're a reviewer and all you do is like praise everything and then never talk about something negative, you're not a reviewer. You're just someone who likes to get free toys and play with them because I just you don't want to ruffle any feathers. Huh? Who? Uh, what? Yeah. So... For MKBHD to say what he said, he's saying it based on his years and years, decade plus of of reviewing products and sharing his information. I do the same thing. If I don't like something, I'm going to tell you that. And we did that recently with a lens and the company was not happy with that. And I don't agree with them saying that. And that's the first time in a long time a company was like, well, if you didn't like it, why did you review it? Well, because people need to know. I think in that particular review, we literally said, don't buy it. There are many other options to buy. Please don't get this one. <laughs> but we don't do it often. No, it's. I said that in the review. Yeah, when there's that many more options. And we'll talk about the 16 to 25 Sony foreshadowing coming up and how there are a lot more options to buy for better pricing and they're good enough. And, and so... If you're not going to point out things that aren't good about a product or you're going to get you're going to get bent out of shape as a company who creates a product because we say something we used to, I used to see this at the beginning when I was doing this. I would say like 10 positive things and point out two things that could be improved and they would get upset about that. I'm like, first off, 
I can't say all positives. It's every Nikon review. We say 95% positive things and we point out one negative thing or Fuji reviews too. Fans of that system will come after us. It's like, guys, we praise this camera or lens and said one thing. We say the same thing about Canon, Sony, anything else. We try to give the pros and the cons. Unless it's a perfect product, which is rare and really doesn't exist, we're going to point out the negatives. And, and in um, MKBHD's rebuttal, because he did a rebuttal, not to Petapixel, but to people complaining about it, he um, he said that like the point of a reviewer or a reviewer is you review a product, you find things that you don't like, and then the company listens because he's an expert in what he does, and then they iterate on that product. They make it better in the future. And we've seen that ourselves with certain products, uh, you know, making certain points about things on that first generation product. And then the second generation comes out and they've fixed those issues. It's because of unbiased reviews that we do give uh, things like that happen. You know, the engineers, the actual camera manufacturers, they do listen and they take note and they fix it. They do listen to us. They do. They really do. And and they've asked for feedback one on one during these briefings of what we think about certain products. And we try to tell them straight up what we think. Yeah, we I, I know that we have a responsibility to the people watching and to the companies to be fair and unmerciful because that's all we're going to be. <laughs> I will say, so, though, kind of like you said about that whole petapixel headline, once it starts off negative, it kind of starts spewing negative comments and asks for that. It's the whole Spider-Man quote with great power comes great responsibility. MKBHD does have a shit ton of influence, which I think kind of starts that negative trend with negative reviews after he's initially uh, reviewed a product and said something bad about it. Yeah. I think then other reviewers kind of take note of that and they're like, well, he said that. So this must be true. I'm going to say the same thing. And it spirals out of control from there with negative well, except, reviews. Except for with this one, he wasn't the first one to put out a review like this and other people but pointed out the same exact things before he even made his he, video. He's the first one with 18 plus million subscribers, you know, I top know. 10 YouTuber. And I, I will say that we've had differences between other other creators in our field that have well, said stuff. My favorite is when we do a review on a Gen 1 product and we say something specific about it that's you know negative and that they need a fix. And then other reviewers point out that it's a great thing. It's positive. Everything's perfect on the camera or the lens or whatever it may be. And then Gen 2 comes out and they then go back and backtrack and basically say, there was an issue with this before. You know, the autofocus is a little weird or whatever it may be. And it's like, guys, you, you praised it from day one. Now you're saying there was an issue with the Gen 1 and not on the Gen 2, like just flip-flopping all the time. There's a lot of people that do that. Name some names, Stephen. Name some names. <laughs> I'm just saying in general. I've seen it. And this is not just the photo community either. This is uh, YouTube in general. I've got some visuals in my head right now of certain people that I'd like to say their names. <laughs> and then coming back around with the whole trading notes with reviewers and stuff like that and kind of seeing what other people have to say. I will always try to ask somebody else that I know has that specific product and see if they're finding the same issues that I'm finding before we just rip them apart online. Uh, because it might be our mistake or maybe we didn't have it set right. But for the most part, we usually do or we'll go directly to uh, an engineer from that company and talk to them. But we always try to figure it out first before we say this product just completely sucks. Yeah. So MKBHD is well-respected continually to be well-respected because he he's not going to put something out that he doesn't test out himself and give his thoughts on. That's what a good reviewer does. They share their thoughts and they have the, the the pedigree and the back catalog to prove why they should be listened to. <laughs> and it's not the first negative one he did. He did the one on the, the Carmen Fisk, not Carmen, but the Fisker car, which then has been taken off the market. But he didn't cause that to happen. But he certainly definitely had something to do with people not, you know, going through with orders and canceling them probably because he showed how bad the product sure. was. It was a safety issue. And he starts off that whole video with, do bad reviews kill companies or do bad products? And that's kind of his point with that Fisker car is that it was generally a bad product and that's what killed the company, not so much his opinion on his bad review towards that what car. What was that really shitty cell phone looking camera with 16? It was a shitty camera with all of the lenses on oh, the back that uh, I that stitches stuff together. They mm. sent me one. Let me, let me, let me. Let's, that let's, wasn't Lytro, right? That was no, no, something no, else. No, fuck. Steven, you want to talk about shitting on a product? Who shit on the Lytro more than this guy? Well, me. that's why I bring it up because the Lytro, we really shit on. You really shit on. 
I called that shit bullshit from day one. They took a shit ton of fucking funding for that, and it never made any sense. It never made any sense. They made a Lytro viewer. For those who don't know, it would take light field photos, so basically allowed you to refocus after the fact. So it was capturing all of this data. And I said it, I said it, I said it at the time, or not too long after that came out, that they're going to get out Lightroad by a cell phone. Yep. Like comp- digital, like uh, computational photography is going to take this over. And Lightroad was just garbage from day one. It's the iPhone's FOCA. I mean, that's really what replaced Lightro, you know, and I knew that would happen. We all knew that would happen. Uh, by the way, that was the Light L16, the 16 lens little smartphone looking camera. Here, how about this? Lytro, and I'll get to that in a second, Stephen. Lytro was founded in 2006 as a refocus Im- imaging by Ren Neg, NG, and as a startup raised over $200 million in funding with the company's value somewhere around $360 million. Google acquires some of Lytro folks to the as the company shutters. Wow. They raised that much money. Oh, and then they came out with a second version that looked like a real camera. Exactly. It was garbage. They had a huge campaign around that second Lytro Illum V2 camera or whatever it was called. And that one finally actually felt and looked like a real camera. I think we didn't we put our hands on it at one of the photo pluses or, or something. I feel yeah, like we at an event. actually used it at an event. We're like, oh, this actually feels much nicer because the original Lytro did not look or feel like a camera at all it was that square looking rectangular box right you actually had one didn't you yeah so i'm just reading this article about Lytro shutting down in 2018 and and then some people getting acquired by uh by google but the fact that they raised two like i can't believe that these companies raise so much money for such garbage and people just give them money for this oh wow uh, sorry uh, i'm just just coming off this mkbhd negative review rant I'm looking at, we actually did review the Light L16 camera. I didn't realize we actually put a review out on it. It's called, This Camera Sucks, But Its Tech Is the Future of Photography. Yeah, because it was I mean, computational that photography. Still holds up, yeah. How Six many years views ago. did that get? Hundred thousand views. Yeah, because that camera sucks. They were they weren't they weren't very happy with me when they when I sent that back. Didn't didn't it sell for like sixteen hundred dollars or something like outrageous? It was super expensive. I don't know. They raised over $30 million. Um, Let's see. The latest $30 million Series C, this is old news, uh, C funding round, which meant there was A, B, and C funding, was led by GV, formerly Google Ventures, and the investment in Google parent company Alphabet. We'll put these funds to good use as we scale our global supply chain to meet overwhelming demand, Light writes. Having top-tier investors like GV support our vision ensures light is the best possible position to conquer this challenge yeah you guys fucking sucked yeah garbage oh, look at this uh looks what? like you pinned a comment on this light l16 review and it says uh this commenter says thanks for the quote unquote review i was an early adopter and funder and i've truly f- tried to make the l16 work well and also i've tried hard to like it neither has occurred it does take pictures but the lumen software truly sucks and has been very slow to receive meaningful updates the android platform works okay until you have to perform hard resets and restarts which as you mentioned are very very slow the only images that work well for adjusting depth of field are the images that have very clear contrast distinction not much of an accomplishment given the other imaging platforms that exist blah 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 he goes on to basically say i own this camera too and it's a piece of crap (laughs) yeah the whole point of that camera was i so this was a failure the idea wasn't a failure the idea was that it would take 60 you know these lenses were paired so if it had 16 it would use four of them to take pictures at this field four for this four for that and then it would mesh them together to give you higher quality, which is computational photography. So even though the product, so (laughs) does this make me an asshole that someone needed to come up with stupid ideas to get funded to then find their home at Google somewhere else where computational photography has a home? Uh, so anyway, but, but, but like, that's the thing. If we didn't call out the garbage of that, then would they still go down that path? Or maybe they were ahead of their time with certain things and the technologies they were creating did end up going into other products, but people lost a lot of money at it because they never got their 200 plus million dollar investment back. And I feel like that's what usually happens when they're ahead of the curve, when they're too early with this technology because they end up overpricing it because that technology is so hard to achieve. Uh, But 
it's so damn expensive. Nobody buys that product and eventually they just go out of business at the end of the day or they get acquired and that tech gets used somewhere else. But wrapping all this up, I think with us at least, it is a gamble for companies to give us a product to review, to check out, to try out, whatever it may be, because it could go either way. They have no idea. You're going to either praise it or you're going to rip it apart or somewhere in between. Companies cannot expect positive reviews just because they gave you a product. Like, we talked about that one lens earlier and they kind of got annoyed that we said something negative about it. What did they say? They said something like, uh, you shouldn't have even reviewed it if you had something negative to say. In the future, if you don't like something, maybe don't review it. Exactly. It's like, what? Why no, would I do that's that? That's the whole point of giving a review. You give your thoughts on it, whether it's positive or negative. Yep. Okay. Let's put that to rest. Yes. That was good, actually, thinking about the light camera and the Lytro camera. And also then my, my brain reframing to go, well, you know what? Even though they created shitty products, the technologies they were working on were a little ahead of their time. But when they got acquired by Google for pennies on the dollar, they were able to fund a different development of the stuff digitally. Interesting. And I will say real quick, that Lytro camera, it, it does do a much better job of refocusing after the fact. Does it though? I'm just saying the iPhone is that digital focus that's happening. It's not really, it's just taking a good deep aperture photo and then blurring it computationally. But yes, it's good enough. That is the whole point. You really yeah. don't need that perfection. Uh, like high end photographers were not buying that to refocus after the fact. No. So yeah, last week I was talking about how I was going to then, uh, after the episode, drive to go get my negatives to see if I how I did. All I knew at the time was that they said that the exposures looked good, which is nice to see that they said that, they, that there was something on the negatives. So I drive the 45 minutes to Delaware to pick up my negatives. I get my negatives. I come back. And thanks to B&H, I had that scanner I mentioned last week that I broke the scanner and then trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> clean it. And then they gave me another one, which I'll send back at some point. But anyway, I, I scanned everything. And then I'm like, this is great. I can take these negatives to someone else. They can process them for me. I don't need to worry about if I'm able to even mix the chemicals and do it. Um, and so I made the decision at that point that I'm going to let these guys develop it. They're the professionals. I'm going to outsource it. I'm going to drive it there, drop off a batch of them, unfortunately wait a week or two to get my stuff back and then i did a shoot at the phillies and i got portraits and i had the chemicals here at the studio and i mixed the chemicals myself actually i mixed the chemicals after i made the decision that i wasn't gonna develop my own stuff steven and i went to the game got some portraits and didn't want to wait or drive somewhere else so i'm like you know what I took six pictures. What I'm going to do is take two of the pictures because I can do a tank of six and I'm going to see if I can develop it myself and just see if there's results. So I go into the dark room. I process those two negatives and I did it. Ooh, look at you, Walter White. Yeah, Walter White. You mean Walter Mitty? <laughs> no, Walter White. <laughs> Great movie, by Not the way. Walter Mitty. Yeah, very good. That was so inspiring as a photographer. I was like, <laughs> it is. That's photography right there. No, not Sean what he did. Penn plays a photographer, right? I would never do what Sean Penn did, which was see the th the elusive thing he was trying to capture and not take the picture at that point. <laughs> but <laughs> I took a picture with my eyes. Yeah, spoilers. But the photojournalistic stuff when they show the images, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Like that's where you get the right here in the feeling area, the feeling button, and and you're like, that's great. That's when so, Jared feels emotions for once. I have emotions. <laughs> I cried the other day, Steven. Did you? Fucking dude. I've only seen I tried, you do that maybe one. Twice maybe. You you were at my apartment when I got a call that my grandfather was about to die in the hospital. You were at my my loft in uh, Fishtown, the other one, the first one. I, I don't recall. Yeah, you were in the other other side when I got that. I talked to him for the last time and he really uh, didn't want to talk or yeah. he didn't that. No, I, I'm the side note. I'm, I'm writing words for my book, the photo book. Mm -hmm. You know, you wanted me to write more words. So I'm doing a, a stream of consciousness like I like to do. Because I like to, to write that. I like to. <laughs> there will be a proofreader. I um, hope <laughs> there is a proofreader that did the last book, and I tell them not to change certain words because they're my words. Don't try to splice it up with somebody else's type of thing. Just grammatics. Change the the, the grammar yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um. But I I got to a point. I'm writing about Perry Farrell and that tour where I was emailing back and forth with my mom. 
right? And it felt like the first time that we were communicating on a different level than just mother, son, Hmm. and actually being like friends and actually communicating. Because I didn't communicate that well with her in person uh, up to that point. And this was also before she was diagnosed with cancer, but she also was sick and wasn't feeling well and we didn't know why. So I I found the emails. Now, these were AOL emails that she sent back in 2007. I forward, I know I forward the, forwarded them to different email addresses in my Gmail at times so that I would be able to find it. Wow. So I found them. I must have forwarded them to myself in about 2012. Um, and I read them. And that was that was tough. Oh, I Cause bet. it's not like you talk to your parent, you're, you're like after your mom dies, like I've talked to her. Well, they, all. they always say too, uh, when someone passes, at least these days, like people tend to text their number, even though they know they're obviously not there just to make it feel like they are still communicating with them personally. Yeah. I sent her an email after she died. So I, uh, I started reading what she was writing, like proud of me and all that shit. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really saying a lot of stuff that was, revolutionary i didn't send it to you yet right no i i had no idea this happened yeah i didn't know you Let even me, saved these oh well yeah i did um i did and that's great you're really good at that i will say like saving important family memories like something like that which you wouldn't even i wouldn't even think about especially that long ago in 2008 uh what tour was 2007 okay but when did she pass though 2008 but yeah. this was i have them from the tour i have the emails i took screen grabs well i have the forwarded emails that have the original emails with her email address sure, and all yeah, that stuff yeah, yeah. like the one of them um uh is a let's see it's her first reply to me sending her a bunch of photos and then it's short it's only a paragraph and it was uh hey jared thanks the uh, thanks for the photos the one of perry smoking in the first frame oh, wow. is absolutely the one This is definitely a CD cover photo. Keep up the great work. Keep dancing to that different drummer. Love you. Fuck. Every fucking time, Steven. Mm, Yeah. Every time. Like, I, this is the only thing that makes me cry. It's like, well, that and like John Coffey being put to death and all. That was very sad in the Green Mile. (laughs) (laughs) That that fucking made me. I fucking was in the movie theater trying not to lose it. I ball every time. I'm like John Coffey. <laughs> John Coffey, why are you fucking dying? <laughs> Fuck! If you uh, didn't cry when John Coffey was finally put to death, and, oh man! And oh, uh, spoilers! Oh shit! I ruined Green, Green Mile, Mile for someone. I ruined Green Mile, but holy fuck! If you haven't seen it by now, <laughs> oh my god! When that happened, anyway, that's the only thing that makes me cry. In John Coffey, <laughs> uh, I didn't Coffey. expect that from you. <laughs> um, anyway, no, my mom stuff always made because you don't read stuff like keep up the great work, keep dancing to the different drummers. She always encouraged me to do that, and then yeah. love you and proud of you, love mom. P.S. Let me know what you think of Reno and Las Vegas. I understand more why that photo resonates with you so much because I do feel like you always come back to that photo and I'm not saying it's a bad photo. It's a great photo. But Which I feel photo? like the Perry smoking one. I feel oh, like I that one you always, that always hit this. hard on every time you bring it up. And now I, because there was, is it because there was, of this? No, it was not because of this. It was just because it was a great photo. It was just the way that it happened, the way that it happened in a split second. It looks like it's done in a studio, but it was done outside of a I didn't even mention that in the book, how that was done, because I'd probably mention See, it in the audio portion. That's the stuff I want to hear in that book. Yeah. Actually, I didn't write that section up. So let me make a note. Perry smoking in detail how it happened. I'll tell you guys how it happened. And then you had to buy the book at some point. Um, <laughs> we're in we're in British Columbia, B.C. And he was uh, not BBC. Just, no, stood outside of the the lock the, the dress I call it locker room baseball the dressing room where there was a floodlight right above him, and so he tilted his head up. He like smoked. He he puffed he, or he sucked it in, and then he and then he blew it out, and then his fingers went around the front of his face, and then stopped in that V position, and it was perfect. But I also have the sequence of images, and I'll be putting in a contact sheet of all of the images that I took in that sequence. So you could see the good, you know, the, the, the keeper, and then you'll see the, all of the other ones. So you'll see the progression. It's really cool. Oh, is that when you guys were, you guys media? I'm looking at the yeah, photo right we now. Were, there's a big giant, you guys media watermark. <laughs> yeah. We From were the guy who media. hates watermarks. Back then I watermarked everything with Perry Farrell or, yeah. or, uh, you know, satellite party when we were on the road. Cause, cause crediting and captioning wasn't really a thing. 
and you wanted people to know it. Yeah. Um, anyway, there, there's a second email from, from my mom, uh, which says, hi, Jared, the photo at night of the pier is beautiful, especially with the moon or silver tide as Walt, Walt Lafty explained his group name to me, um, is special. I don't, I don't know what photo that is. I don't know. See, cause the date of this email, I, I bet I better dig in deeper. Cause I, there is one photo where I did with, um, Perry and his wife in San Diego walking on the pier, uh, at night. And so I don't know if it's that, but I, I, I don't recall when I sent this, but there's something else here. Um, yeah, it's shifting over the water, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and then she goes, let's see the moon shining off the world. Also, I must say those aren't the same mountains I saw when I was in California. Ha ha. Yeah. So the mountains she's referring to, I'm going to show Steven on my phone real quick. And, um, I'm going to show Steven on my phone real quick, the mountains that, 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 that I was, that she's referring to. I am now showing Steven the photo. It's just a blurry mess against your web. Oh, there you go. (laughs) It just focused. (laughs) What is it? Steven explain it. Uh, I would consider them more melons than mountains, but uh, (laughs) if you catch my drift, (laughs) Uh, it's basically someone flashing the camera. Uh, I guess they're uh, at the front of the pit or something. Yes. She was at the front of the pit and she was uh, holding her, her boobs in both hands quite a handful and so i show i sent those to my mom over aol and i said these were the mountains that i saw in california no i think <laughs> i was talking about going over the mountains and then i just posted that and then she goes on to say some other stuff in the email and anyway that totally sidetracked from from developing my four by five but uh that's the shit I mean, that that's kind of how the show me. runs we're all over the place <laughs> that that gets me every time so uh. i'm writing that stuff for the book and so there will be written words. And then, of course, we're going to do another podcast version of the book, another audio portion so that people have even more detail about everything. I can't and wait other to stories make that, that little soundproof fort around you and have you in there for 10 hours recording. I mean, <laughs> like theoretic- Stephen, theoretically, we could go into another room. We have that little room over there and you could just put up the sound blankets over that thing. It's probably the better thing to do. That's all I need is just to laptop. surround you with sound blankets or something because that the acoustics in that place are just absolutely terrible. So anyway, no, no word on when that book is coming. We're to, uh, it will be when it will, when it, when it will be, but back to the four by five stuff, it was really great to see those negatives in person and see that my exposures were basically spot on or Perfect. close enough. Perfection. And well, part of it was I, I use that app. Who I am. Well, yes, I'm really good. <clears throat> Part of it was I used that app on my phone and it worked perfectly. Cool. Like the fact that I was able to use an app on my phone without an adapter and it just uses the camera to measure the light is just insane that I was able to do that. So that made me happy. I wanted to ex- outsource everything to them except for the three hours of travel, the four trips that I have to do that are 30, 45 minutes each. And the fact and that you got to wait over a week. week. Yeah. So I made the decision to do the extra batch myself. So I did the next four. Then I did the next eight. And I've done like 20 or so that I processed myself. I just processed uh, six more this morning from the other day. Uh, and I've got more to do this afternoon. Do you put your phone on like do not disturb or, or not even bring it in to the quote unquote dark room? That's basically the bathroom <laughs> because I'm always scared to text you or to to message you in general because I don't want your watch or phone going off ruining any uh, of your negatives. Yeah. So my watch is left outside of the bathroom door. Okay. So how it works upstairs is we've got uh, blackout shades, mm-hmm. which do a really good job. Not perfect, but good enough. I then the bathroom is around a corner. So light doesn't travel around corners. There's no windows in the bathroom like we have downstairs here. And so it's completely sealed for the most part. Mm-hmm. Under the door, I put one of the sound blankets at the base of the door just in case there's stray light. And I make sure all of the lights are off upstairs altogether. I leave my phone underneath the sound blanket in a fold of the sound blanket. Okay. Right. So that it's not in my pocket and it's in the sound blanket. So, or I leave it outside of the room when I'm just changing negatives or putting negatives in the carrier. When I'm putting negatives in the, uh, the, the four by five, uh, uh, case, uh, the four by five, what do they call it? Tank, the developing tank. I, I have the, the camera, sorry, the phone with me underneath. 
But dude, I it took me an extra 15 minutes to get the thing in the tank today. I was having such a struggle with it, mm. but telling myself to stay relaxed and calm because you could. And dude, I just couldn't get it in the hole. I just couldn't get the fucking it's thing to find the thing. It's usually what happens with you, yeah? Yeah. So it was very difficult. Anyway, I finally got it. So what I do is once the the once the um the lid is on the tank, it's light tight now. I still do everything in the dark though because I don't fully want to trust that sure yeah so it's in the tank i then take my phone out because i know that it is light sensitive it's not light sensitive anymore and so my phone is already dark i go to this developing app so there's an app that i paid 8.99 for that is called it is called massive dev and it has every 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 developer chemical every film stock and time and it gives you the exact heat the temperature in degrees celsius like petapixel would do <sighs> and not give us fahrenheit, fahrenheit. <laughs> so it gives you 20 degrees celsius which is 68 degrees fahrenheit so i have to get make sure my chemicals are around 68 degrees because you want to you know development time of nine minutes so you can hit the button and it's a timer so it 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 does give you a little bit of light so i put that underneath in a cabinet and it and i can hear the beeps the beeps mean it's time to agitate every 30 seconds for 30 seconds, and then it stops, and then it dings at the very end when it's done. Cool. And so uh, um, so anyway, there's a developing time there. I go through the process. I hang my negatives to dry in there. They end up getting dust on them, which is fine. I actually like the, the, the non-perfect cleanliness of the images. I think if it was too clean, then it just looks digital. And yeah, but I, I've noticed I've noticed when scanning and I'm not talking about massive issues with dust. I and I'm cleaning up dust if it's in the face or something like that in a place where it's a problem. But when I'm processing that uh scanning them um and 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 then I go and I de- develop them in Lightroom process them. I I don't want to overdo the sharpening and I don't want to overdo the contrast because I don't want it to start to look digital. I want it to still maintain some of that softness of that kind of like 18% gray look. It, it's like it's like this dance. It's like a dance because to be you want to No, I, I don't want it to go over the top because then it gets over sharp oh, and there's you. a happy medium because it's film. It has a different feel and a different look. And I see it that if you up contrast and you up sharpening and, and, and certain not sure, I don't touch sharpening, but the texture and all of that, you then start to see this sh- over sharpening of certain areas Halo and that to me ghosting just doesn't like look that. natural. Yeah. It just doesn't look. No, I don't even get the halo or the ghosting. It just looks it just looks like artificial a digital. Yeah. yeah. And so if I pull back just a little bit and and be a little softer with my contrast at like 14 percent, you know, 14 instead of 60, it's a different ball game. Do you use the masking when you do sharpening or are you just like sharpening? The I don't do sharpening image? at all. I don't sharpen at all. Oh, OK. It's whatever the bare bone sharpening is. I leave it at that. Um what I did do in one of the, some of them is I'll use the uh, masking tool to select the sky or the background just to bring it down a little bit, right? But what you have to think about is there's so much detail in a 4x5. There's f- more detail in a 4x5 than a 35 or a full frame image. My dad called me yesterday. He didn't call during the show right now. He called me and he's like, I'm trying to figure out if a four by five, like, is it just, you get like, I know what a three by five card looks like. Is that like the total size of an image? And that's small. And I'm like, and I get angry. Cause I don't know why I have zero patience for this. Like if someone <laughs> else asked me a question, your dad. <laughs> if someone else asked me a question, I would take the, you know, explain it. You would explain terms. it to them like a two year old. Yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 then I did. And I'm like, so to understand four by five, it's 15 times larger than 35 millimeters. There's 15 times more information in four by five than there is in 35. The sheer size wise, it's 15 times larger. Imagine how much data you're capturing. So yes, I'm getting a four inch by five inch negative instead of a 35 millimeter negative. And he couldn't picture how small that was. So that was a little frustrating, but you know, I'm like, that's tiny, that's small. So when I make a scan of this, there's so much more detail where I make a print of it. There's going to be so much more detail to work with. And so I explained it to him that way. What's the resolution that you're scanning at? Well, 
the, the test scans or the basic scans that I do that only take like 30 seconds, I do at 600 DPI. Okay. Right, which is not huge. When I do the ones that take a couple minutes, I do it at like 2300 DPI just because I'm looking at what's giving me like a 400 megabyte file. Jesus. <laughs> So I don't I don't know the resolution that the scanner is doing, um, but people I know I'm not scanning the exact way that the scanner is meant to scan. There's holders for the four by five, right? That that it's like a holder that raises it off the scan bed a little bit and then you scan it with the scanner. But the reason I'm not doing that is because it doesn't have the border. It's going to get rid of the four by five border. To me, that's the whole image. Right. Yeah, I want to see the the notches in the film. I want to see the border of the film because that shows full frame. I agree. Again, not cropped. Yeah. Um, so I am literally laying the negative right on the glass and scanning it. Is that the best way to do it? The answer is no. I've watched some videos on guys using the V850, trying many different methods. But what I'm thinking is that for what I'm doing right now, it's good enough. I'm labeling by each game, so everything's organized, so I can go back uh, and, and and find the right negatives, but I'm going to want to get them drum scanned, which is the highest scanning you can possibly do. But anyway, that's the process I'm going to go through. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with all these photos other than right now posting them on my Instagram. Oh, what I do want to say is I started to get portraits of the players and I have video of this. I've got the Insta 360 go three on my head looking like a douche. And I've got the 360, um, the, the one inch 360 always next to me recording this entire thing. So I asked Stubbs to be the first one that I did a portrait with. Is it the best portrait? No, I cut his hands off, whatever. Then I asked, uh, Marsh, uh, uh, if, if he would sit on the bench for me and he did and I got a great shot of him and so what I did is I developed I, I developed those myself scanned them and printed them so I could take them back out to the field to show the other players so I asked Kyle Schwarber the one of the best you know Phillies uh, hitters he's a DH I'm like hey can I do a portrait of you now that uh, um, the batting practice is over and I'm like here's what I did with Marsh and I show him he's like yeah give me a minute and then he comes over and I did two portraits of him and and so for another game I printed out all of the good prints I have so far gave him the stubs who then took it back to the locker room left him out on the table for everybody to get their pictures that's cool. everybody from the the manager to the players and they loved it and the whole reason I do prints off the Canon Pro 1000 printer plug that not a plug um, <laughs> off the Canon Pro 1000 could be a plug off the printer is that these guys have seen me shooting. They don't know what I'm doing. They don't know what it, the photos. They don't know what the results are. Yeah. And just showing somebody something on your phone doesn't make that doesn't, doesn't do it. Justice. That doesn't resonate. Yeah. But when they saw these prints, I'm standing on the field before the game and Marsh comes up to me and fist bumps me and thanks me for the photos. I'm just standing there and I, I wasn't recording at the time, but Nick Castellanos comes behind running off the field right before the game. He taps me on the shoulder and he's like, yo, thanks for the photos. Those are great. Wow. And then keeps running into the dugout. Very cool. Um, when I showed when I showed Schwarber the box of prints and I showed him the print, he's like, fuck yeah. I was recording for that. And so <laughs> we're going to... I'm going to have some content made, whether it's reels or shorts, um, to go along with this. How do you think the guys describe you? They're like, yeah, it's the guy with the big afro. What do you think they're saying? I the know guy with the big arms or the guy with the small arms or the guy with the really they tight describe me. <laughs> I know that they, they've said they've talked, sh not talked shit in a bad way for the last couple of years. The guy that thinks he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I shoot raw shirt. They are talking about my shirt in the in the locker room. Well, I'm sure they, they think it's sexual. No, well, they the know what that you're is, wearing it every single day. And I show off these awesome arms. But JT Real Muto, the Phillies catcher the mm -hmm. other day, was like best shirt in baseball. He said <laughs> again. He, he probably thinks it's all sexual. <laughs> yeah, sexual chocolate. But you know what it is. Um, so. I wrote about this and I think I posted it on Facebook the other day. I'll wrap this up in just a second because there's a few things I, I want to say about personal projects, but I've been getting extra portraits of the opposing team players, the better, you know, whoever they are. Uh, the great news was that the Colorado Rockies were here and their team photographer is friends with another team photographer who I went to Kenya with in, a in, in Africa, hmm. if you forget. Uh, you went to Africa? He, no. He was like, hey, Jared's coming. Can you check with some players to see if they'd be up for this? One of the players, 
owns my video guide, it turns out, because he got into photography. He bought a Nikon ZFC to learn with, and that's what he's learning with, but he bought my video to understand things. This is why we need to update it, because mirrorless. But he came up to me, thanked me, and he sat for two awesome portraits. These are where these portraits are getting intimate. I'm taking more time. Well, I mean, three to three minutes to less than three minutes to do one picture, which isn't bad, but they're giving me the time. I make it clear. Don't move. Once I focus, you can't move. These guys were great. He was good. One of the pictures was awesome. I got some great, great shots. And so that's what I'm going to focus on is also getting pictures of other teams, uh, portraits of their better players, because I don't want to bother the Phillies too much. Hey man, I, I could see even a photo book at the end of the season of every team. There's a couple players on every team. You know, I'm already doing you want to know what I'm doing, Stephen? What? Uh, I ordered 16 by 20 paper, inkjet paper from Red River. Mm-hmm. That's where I order. Anybody wondering what inkjet paper I use is from Red River. And I use the, uh, I, sometimes I use Arctic Polar Luster, but I've been using this uh, soft gloss rag. It's luster. Anyway, I ordered the 16 by 20 and I ordered um, 16 by 20 Itoyo view books. Remember those? I used to carry around a little portfolio, a five by seven and a four by six one. It's the black covered book with the 24 sheets of sleeves sleeves inside to allow you to put 48 pictures in. I ordered the 16 by 20 ones so that I'm going to make and I can get 48 in a book. I better order. I ordered two books because I know I'm going to go over the over that. But I'm going to print out 16 by 20s. It's going to cost me some money to do this, but I'm going to put it in the books and I'm going to make sure I take it to the stadium with me every time I go so that I can show people. I also ordered eight by 10 in, uh, paper and eight by 10 books so I can do the same thing if I travel or on a smaller scale. Because once people see the work, they go, oh, fuck, I want to get my picture taken like this. Like Stubbs, Garrett Stubbs, he's like, I want to get some of these framed. Can I Can I get some of these framed? I'm like, yeah, I got you. Like, that's that's what it's all about. Let me explain why 16 by 20 and 8 by 10 real fast. 4 by 5 is an 8 by 10 aspect ratio, and 16 by 20 divides into that perfectly too. So crazy. It's not 17 by 22, which would leave a lot of extra white borders. It's weird how that Fuck works. Fuck you, Stephen. <laughs> Fuck you. Let me explain something that's very simple. <laughs> no, this is what I do. I'm educating. Uh, I'm educating, Stephen. I just love when you break down the, the very simple things. That's, what, that's what's funny. <laughs> Stephen, there's people sitting out here right now that didn't really think about four by five or... 35 millimeter where four by six is full frame. And do you ever wonder why eight by 10 was the size and you lost two inches off of your print where you're like, shit, I know I got this in the frame, but you get an eight by 10 back and some douchebag at CVS sitting behind the printer has to make the decision of, of what to cut. I would always do eight by 12s for certain people if they asked, but the issue is it's more of a custom frame that you need for an eight by 12 if you want full frame. Three to two aspect no, ratio. Exa- exactly. Anyway, I'm losing my voice because I'm talking so much, and that's not good. Um, the one thing I wanted to say to wrap up this section uh, before we get to the very last things um, is sometimes you just have to stand out. Of course. Let me read what I wrote. You've got to stand out and do something different. Sometimes you have to just do a project because you want to, not because you know what the outcome will be. Personal projects take on all shapes and sizes, but you never know where they will lead or what doors they will open. Not everything has to be for money. Now, I know it might be hard to get past the part about money, but not all projects need to be expensive. They just need to start. I know that this is costing me thousands upon thousands of dollars, this project, this Daddy year to do. though. It, uh, five prop. It's taking away from me <laughs> buying my sixth property as a global influencer. Oh, my God. But there's things that are going to happen out of this that, that, like, I had visions of, you know what, maybe I'll go, sh- the, the major, maybe Major League Baseball will look at this and be like, you know what, let's send him around to every stadium this year to do this project. The Ansel Adams of the MLB. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna pitch this, dude. Hey, so many you never people, know. I mean, that it, it is a very unique thing that you're doing. I had a chance the other day. The commissioner of Major League Baseball was standing behind the at the field oh, the other see, day. That's the chance, man. Yeah, I didn't take it because I didn't want to get yelled at. But I should have just been like, Mr. Manfred, um, Manfred, um, can I do a portrait? Like it's the 1940s with film, and then that then that gets. I think you know, I should have done it as simple as that. That's all you need to I say, know, and people are like, "Whoa, yeah." I didn't want to just you know get in his way, but I also yeah, yeah. know that 
people say that he he's very hesitant because they don't know where it's going to go to sit for something, sure. especially something they can't see. But I think that the way that I explain things is like, look, this is a 19, this is a project I'm doing. Here's some of the results that I've gotten. I'm shooting like it's the 1940s. I want to do a commissioner portrait like it was 1940. And like we've always said, the worst thing he can say is no. And you move on. Right. And so, or they take away your pass and you're screwed, <laughs> which is, which was of course going through my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I should have done it, but I'm going to talk to mystery man about submitting a proposal to the league. Cause maybe I could go do the all-star game where I go and I get all-star portraits on the field that or, would be the game or somewhere. Be at, yeah. Uh, and then like the hall of fame, but at the very least I, I might pitch the Phillies on doing some sort of ga- gallery, maybe a charity gallery sure. where all of these pictures get, printed large and they do a fundraiser for the you know whatever the players for their charities i would do that would i like to make money of course i'd like to make money but a lot of stuff can come out of it that somewhere the doors that get opened from a project like this just lead to successes and so i don't have to to make money at it gold (laughs) more properties exactly so I don't have to make money at it, but I think things are going to happen. Yeah, I do. I th- just, just the, the, I just the think for you, it's, that- it's the whole switching up the uh, monotony of, of taking baseball photos every single day. I mean, this, what was it? 11 games in a row this past week and a half. So how boring would that be? Just shooting the same thing over and over with your R3, where this time around you're, you're slowing things down. You're taking the time. You're turning into a film photographer. I'm almost at that point already. Though, Everything Steven. we've always hated. What? <laughs> I'm almost at the point of, uh, you know, it starts to become repetitive even with this. So now I'm challenged myself with trying to get the guys running out of the dugout. Well, have you <laughs> which stayed for easy. a full game yet? No, that's going to happen this weekend. I think you need to do that. Like you're just doing well, batting practice and piecing out, right? No, I stay for the beginning of the game. Yeah. I've been doing that. But what I'm going to do is focus on the field uh, this weekend. I got in some color negative stuff. I might just change it up a little bit and do some color stuff as well. And so that's what I'm going to look into. Anyway, it's a big project. A um, couple of things. La- last thing to talk about the Sony 16 to 25. Steven had a lot to talk about, about this lens that Sony came out with. And I'm, I'm going to hand this, I'm going to hand this over to Steven to talk for a little bit so I can rest my voice. Steven, tell us about this 16 to 25 and what you think about it. Uh, so the 16 to 25, I was actually not briefed on this one for once. You took the call for this because we knew we weren't going to do a video on it. Mine is putting it into fix because it is a an odd focal range in my opinion it pairs perfectly with its brother lens the 25 to 50 but it is a 16 to 25 2.8 g lens not to be confused with a gm a g master lens and essentially sony is going after tamron sigma the third party lenses their contemporary lineups you know those cheaper lenses uh where they're selling for seven eight hundred bucks you can get a trinity for like three grand or under and that's what they're doing with these new G lenses, the 16 to 25 and the 25 to 50. I just think Sony is still overpricing these lenses at $1,200 for this one. I think it was 1100 for the 25 to 50. And you're not getting the same focal length coverage either. You're only getting up to 50 millimeters opposed to, say, having a 17 to 28 from Tamron and a 28 to 70 as well. You're getting that extra 20 to 25 millimeters on the long end and you're paying much less for it. There's a lot more options than just the 16 to 25 right now. And I think that's what's going to take away sales from this lens. Like you can get the 16 to 28 from Sigma, the 2.8 Contemporary for $899. The Tamron 17 to 28 28 is 800 bucks on sale right now. Or you can even get the 14 to 24 from Sigma if you want to go even same wider price. for basically the same price. It's like 1230 bucks on sale right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're getting an eight degree field of view difference from 14 to 16, which is a big Huge. deal when you're going wider, ultra wide like that. Yeah. At the end of the day, I just think Sony's trying hard to get back the loss of sales from those, those lower end lenses from the third party manufacturers with the 16 to 25 and the 25 to 50. But I just don't think they're doing it the right way with how they're pricing things out. Granted, it's much less than a G Master and you're still getting probably better uh, quality optics, better autofocus. It's lighter and smaller. You're getting the 11 blade apertures opposed to like the the 7, 8 or 9. Uh, It's supporting the Sony higher frame rate. Overall, it's probably a better lens. But when people are shopping on a budget like that, they're going to always opt for the the less expensive uh, lens over the quality of the lens, I think. Yeah. The the way that I good good points and the way that I wrote uh, this up in Photo News Fix was for beginners or anybody just starting, 
you're going to save the three, four, five hundred dollars by going with the Tamron or the Sigma. It's just a better choice. I actually have the prices written down. If you got the pair, for example, from Sigma, the 16 to 28 and the 28 to 70, it's sixteen hundred dollars for that pair of lenses. So you're going from 16 to 70 millimeters, 2.8 all the way through. If you get the Tamron pair, the 17 to 28 and the 28 to 75, that's seventeen hundred dollars. And again, 17 to 75 millimeters all the way through. And for Sony, if you're getting the 16 to 25 and 25 to 50, it's $2,300. So a six, $700 difference. And you're losing out on that 20 to 25 millimeter uh, coverage on the long end. You're only getting up to 50 millimeters. So yeah. it's like you're, you're, you're spending more and you're getting less. Granted, again, quality optics, I'm sure it's better overall lens lenses, but it doesn't really matter to this demographic who are just looking for a budget-friendly lens that's good enough. Yeah. So what I was what I, what I was thinking is that the only people that this lens will be for um, the 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 Sony ones is a Sony video shooter who needs something lighter. That's qual. They know you're going to get the better autofocus. You're going to get the better optics. Because yes, the optical quality of it's going to be great. It's going to be they're great lenses. It's going to be a better price, overall lens for sure. Right for the price, not really. But if they're putting it exactly. on a gimbal, they're putting it on the they're flying it. They use it as a, a B or C camera thing, and they want to stick with the Sony stuff because. They know that the focus and everything's going to be better. That's the people that are going to buy it that 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 don't need the G Master for this particular need, but want the better Sony thing. They're going to stick with it. But other than that, it, it's really a tough sell. And then just to wrap it up, the Trinity Tamron, if you bought everything from the 17 to 28, 28 to 75, and then their 70 to 180 lens or whatever, it's about three grand. I'm assuming Sony's going to come out with their own 50 to 150 millimeter 2.8 lens or something like that uh, to match, you know, the Trinity from Tamron. But I'm sure they're going to price it much higher. It's going to be probably sixteen, seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars because what's their G Master like twenty eight hundred bucks, something Expensive. like that. So you're looking at probably over four grand for that Trinity eventually when Sony comes out with their version of their uh, 7200 or 50 to or 70 to 180. Um, but for Tamron, it's like three grand for the Trinity. Yeah. So you're going to be saving like a thousand bucks. You can get a whole nother lens. Yerp a derp. Yerp a derp. I got to wrap it up, Stephen. I've got I've got many, many, many buildings to go by today. <laughs> so I I uh, uh, no, I want to get back into the dark room to process. I've got to make you some plugs. Man, I never thought I'd hear that from you. Yeah, I got to get back into the dark room. In, not light room, but the dark room. No, I've got four. I got only four negatives, so it's not a full batch, but I'm not going to wait to to get the rest. I'm going to get them processed. Cool. Um, and also, I did some tests with the 400, millim- so the 400 ISO stuff, too. So I've got to process those to see how they look. Also, real I'll quick. Taking that out. We did put out the uh, Insta360 X4 video. Check that out if you're into 360 uh, action style cameras. It's a pretty unique, interesting camera. A little bit on the niche side with being 360 and all. But I do think uh, it's pretty cool for content creators. We use those cameras all the time. We really do. I do. Yeah. And just like I've been using it out at the field. Yep. yep and yep. that's why you'll, that's how, that's how you're able to see me shooting and the subject I'm capturing. There's just so many things you can do with 360. You know, you can really reframe after the fact. It is a little more of a pain in the ass to edit because you do have to, you know, do a lot of keyframing and stuff like that, but uh, you get a lot of unique angles out of it. All right. You want to text us? 313 710 9729. 313 710 9729. That's how you text us. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go. Steven's going to go. And, that, and that's going to be it, right, Steven? Yes, sir. All right, guys, thank you very much for listening. Jared, polinfronosphoto.com. See ya. Bye.